Hi, good morning and welcome to this, another of these three introductory classes about local wild herbs that can be used as herbal medicines and wild foods. I'm Vivian Campbell, I'm a herbalist. I uh, qualified as a herbalist in 2003 and um, all my life is working with plants that are edible, medicinal and can be used in uh, natural uh, personal care products, cosmetics and deodorants and things like that too. Um, so I teach people from total beginners, so I know there are people on today and this is the first thing they've ever been on about herbs or foraging and you're most welcome. And I teach it all the way through different levels to training courses for professionals. So um, the thing that um, really all of these have in common is um, it doesn't matter what level you're at, you I really want to encourage you to start to engage with the plants that are around you and you can learn a little bit about a few or a lot about a lot but um, the, the thing is to start to discover them because it really does transfer uh, transform your experience of where you live and um, I know that because that's what, what I've experienced with it over the last 20 years of my life and whether I've lived out in the countryside or I've lived in a town or a city and at shared houses and apartments, I have um, managed to find wild medicinal and edible plants and use them. So really for me, foraging happened out of necessity because I was so young when I started to do this that um, I was so young when I started to do this, I didn't have a house and a garden and all this stuff that I could cultivate. So um, it, it really, if I wanted to use plants and work with them making things, I love making things. You know, I make, I cook everything from scratch. I bake everything from scratch. I craft everything from scratch. I delude myself that I can sew well enough to make clothes as well, but I can't really. <laughs> But uh, I do, you know, on the rare occasions I venture into a shop, I do think, I do think oh, for heaven's sake, I can make that, that's rubbish, you know, <laughs> I can make better than that. And um, so I, I love um, making things. So for that connection with the, with the plants and, and making your medicine and making your food and, and making the extracts, you know, it really is very, it's a magical experience. And for me, because I didn't have my own home and garden and, and medicinal herb garden that I could cultivate, it really meant I was off on an adventure just on my bike. I didn't even drive. Uh, I just had a, a rickety old bike with some jam jars and bags and I would just go out and cycle around and see what I could find and collect and what I could make from them. So um, I, I know that you can do this wherever you live because that's that's how I had to do it. So I didn't have a perfect setup. And um, so it was it was wonderful because it made me learn about what there actually was. And, and the great thing about learning about wild plants, once you get the, the really basic safety stuff to, to keep you safe so that you don't go wrong and pick something poisonous, um, the great thing about learning about local plants is um, that the, the wild ones is that they don't need any minding. They don't need any care. They don't need any fertilizer. They don't need you to go out and look after them. They're just, they're already strong and thriving where they are, you know? So I, I like people that are independent and I like plants that are independent. So it's, um, they, they're, they're um, you know, they're good and strong and they're healthy. And really all you need to do is go out there and find them and meet them rather than um, putting loads and loads of energy and, and, you know, in a lot of cases, chemicals into um, cultivating things. So, and, and where they're growing in the wild, they're very strong because they've, they've adapted to survive there, you know, they've, um, they're the plants that are thriving in that environment where other things haven't coped as well. So they're very, very strong um and um yeah it's just a lovely thing to discover and even if all you do is you just start to notice you just start to recognize a few plants then that's enough you know you don't need to go off and make a hundred things or learn loads of facts about them it's just this is a a long this is a lifelong journey really and um 
even if you just notice, uh, it's like being able to notice, know the names of a few birds or wild animals. It's just, it's lovely when you see them again and you meet them again. So it can really be the same with the plants. And I hope um, that's, uh, <clears throat> I hope that's nice for you. It certainly is something that I've found very encouraging and inspiring in, in my own life. Um, especially when you live in towns and cities, it can feel quite isolating and to start to see these plants thriving in adversity really is uh, it's a lovely it's a lovely thing to watch and um, you know it, it, nature will always find a way and particularly just now we're seeing it's kind of coming back and taking over where, where spaces of where, where spaces and opportunities open up for it then um, nature's does designed to be abundant and to adapt and to thrive and grow and it will find a way and and things recover very quickly um, if we give them the chance to so it's just a lovely thing to connect with in your life on whatever level suits you you know on whatever level suits you and there's levels for everyone um lovely just the same for me finding what there is no matter what the situation yeah absolutely yeah yeah lovely thing to do. So I'm just going to have a slurp of tea and we'll get cracking. So we've looked at lots of different spring plants over the last um, whatever it is five or six weeks maybe I've been doing these now since mid-March um, and uh, you'll see some of them behind me here um, but the one I want to focus on oops, sorry I'll look at the camera when I say that so that you can hear me the one I want to focus on today is um, falling all over the place here. Hang on. Is this one? And um, because it's just starting to come into season and um, it's prolific, it grows in all sorts of different habitats. I know I had a question already from someone about where you find it growing. Um, and uh, it grows in loads of countries around the world. It's, it's actually. It's 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 little valued. It's little noticed. It's uh, it's underused and underappreciated. And I'd really like to change that. I've certainly been working with this plant for at least a decade, um, because it's prolific. And uh, where something is prolific in the wild, uh, where there's just heaps and heaps of it, that's the first thing I go and look at generally, because I think, well, why there's so much of this? what can be done and uh, should we be using it and I remember going out um, walking it's just sort of all fields out behind where I live just now and going out walking there years ago and and uh, there were a few few of us out for a walk and and we climbed over one of the stone walls into into another field and it was just absolutely lush and it hadn't been cut for a while and and it was so full and I just said look at this this field is absolutely full of wild food and herbal medicine and nobody knows that it's here you know and this was one of the plants so without any further ado this is called a uh, silver wheat or silver leaf because it's got a silvery colored leaf um and um Potentilla and Serena is the Latin name. It's in the rose family. Um, and uh, it's very, very easy to recognize. And it's very easy to find. Um, if you're not seeing it where you are just now, it's probably just because it's a little bit too early and you'll, you'll start to see it, probably notice it over the next couple of weeks. And then it grows for months, you know? It's usually, you'll see the, the leaves still there in September. Uh, it will start to die back then when the weather gets cold. But this is something that you will see growing for at least half the year. And um, it tends to favor areas where it's damp, so where there's wet ground. But you'll, um, so you'll get it in fields and ditches and um, flooded fields. So fields where um, they might flood at certain times of the year and then it dries up again. If you go down into that area where it, it's flooded, you tend to find a lot of plants that really love water. So you'll get lots of silverweed, lots of wild mint, uh, lots of meadow sweet. Um, they tend to be the ones that you get a lot of in the, in the very wet spaces. 
Um, but um, silver weed is, um, will also grow up through the cracks in your driveway. You might see it'll be smaller than this. It gets bigger than this too. If, it's, if, the, if the grass is left uncut, it will get a bit bigger. It's, not, it's never huge, but it might get you know, this tall. Um, and, um, but, it, but you will get it growing through cracks in the concrete in the driveway and in, in the pavements. And it's, it's, a, it, it's a real determined one like dandelions. Any, any little crack, it will pop up. And um, uh, you'll also find it growing down on the beach. Um, you'll see it growing down there as well. So it, it loves, uh, it's very adaptable. It loves a lot of different habitats. Do you recognize it? It is one that people tend to recognize even if they don't know the name of it. So it's silvery green on top and then it's very silvery on the back. So um, it's, uh, it's lovely and it grows in lighter shade as well. It's not one where um, you have to have full sunlight. I, I picked this um, this was the first one to come up where I live. There's a tiny little bit of it coming up through the driveway, um, but this was coming up uh, underneath the blackcurrant bushes. And I went out, there's a lot of it out in the fields behind my house, but it's not up there yet. So it was uh, actually coming up in the shade first. Um, so with um, silverweed, um, we tend to use the tops of the plants, so the leaves, as a herbal medicine and then the roots make a really wonderful wild food which I'll come on to talk about. Um, oh that's nice, Pauline's saying I love feeling them, yeah lovely soft leaves, you're right they are, they're beautiful, they're really nice and soft, <laughs> they're lovely, yeah. Oh, I used a tea of this uh, for my courgette plants. So as a feed, as a as a um, a plant food, a fertilizer years ago, and it was fantastic. That's very interesting. Very interesting. So I always say with herbal teas, we'll probably talk a little bit about different types of extracts you can make. But herbal teas are the easiest way to make um, herbal medicines. They bear no resemblance at all to um, the little herbal teas you get in tea bags, you know, proper medicinal strength herbal teas have got a really rich flavour and um, they're absolutely packed full of nutrients from the plant. So I'm always saying to people um, not to throw away their herbal tea because tea, it doesn't have a preservative. So you need to drink it within 24 hours of making it, whether it's hot or it's cold is up to you. And then after 24 hours, you can use it on your hair or your skin. Uh, if you want to use it as a rinse for your hair and scalp or as a toner on your skin. And then after 48 hours, it does start to get more and more bacteria in it and start to get really smelly. So that's the stage where I would use it the way that Pauline was suggesting as a, a food, a, a, fer a fertilizer for, for vegetables and, and plants that you're cultivating, whether it's, 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 it's edible things in the garden or even your indoor house plants. Um, so I always pour my herbal tea onto my plants um, and never pour them down the sink. So because there's there's such um, great nutrition in there for them. So that's lovely to hear about it as a courgette feed. That's great. Um, oh, lovely. Gosh, that's thanks, Paul. Nice to see you. <laughs> you're, you're from you. Thanks. Um, OK, can you freeze herbal teas? Um, Pauline says, if any of you have ever made uh, plant feed like nettle liquid or comfrey liquid or whatever, which is used in organic gardening to feed plants that you're cultivating like tomatoes and potatoes and things, um, they do get incredibly smelly and Pauline's saying, yeah, it's good stuff, but it would, it would, knock, it would knock a horse after a month. <laughs> the smell would knock a horse. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Jenny's saying, can you freeze herbal teas? So um, you could make the herbal tea up actually and freeze the herbal tea, absolutely. Um, if you wanted to, that would be fine. I don't recommend, so, so making the actual liquid and freezing the liquids, that would be fine. Sometimes if it's a medicinal herbal tea, like if it's something that people would take for a sore throat or a cough, sometimes people freeze them into the actual teas or the, 
the cordials or the syrups, freeze them in, in ice cube trays. And then it's actually quite handy because you get a little portion of it that you can pop out and, and defrost one, one at a time. So that's quite handy. Um, I wouldn't freeze the herbs. That's what I want to say about freezing is um, I find if you freeze herbs, they go very watery. The extracts go very watery and, and they, they're not good and strong and they tend to go off and ferment. So if you want to preserve the herbs, you, you know, drying the herbs is really easy and then you can make your herbal teas from fresh or dried herbs. But uh, yeah, if you've got a big batch of tea that you've made, by all means, put it in the freezer if you want to, that's fine. You just need to sort of drink it up within 12 hours or whatever if, you're, if you've defrosted it. But um, some um, herbal teas lend themselves really well to um, desserts like sorbets and jellies and, and things like that. So um, you could use your herbal tea as a basis for a, a sorbet. Um, it's so easy to do things like that. If, you, if you've got a wild, I'm not really saying much about it. I'll come back on to silverweed again, I promise. Now you, can, now you know why it was taking two hours to do two herbs. Um, but um, a really lovely thing to do with wild food recipes is, um, or, 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 or to make a, take a standard recipe and, and add your wild food into it is, if you've got a recipe that calls for boiled water, um, like sorbet or, or jelly, or in some cases cakes, there are some cakes I, I make and, and water is a big part of the batter that uh, is used for the cake mix. Um, I actually just substitute a, a, a herbal tea for, for just plain boiled water. And it's a really easy and effective and delicious way to get the wild food into something and give it that really special flavor. So I use um, elderflower, fresh elderflower tea. So the elders, um, you know, they'll be, they'll be flowering in the next 10 days or so. Um, I use primroses, um, I use roses, um, meadow sweet flowers as well to make a, a lovely floral herbal tea. And then I'll use that to make jelly or, or sorbet or in the cake. And it's really lovely. It's just really, really lifts it. It makes it very special. And it's such a simple, simple thing to do. Um, but yeah, if you want to, drying herbs is, is the best way really to, um, to, so to store them so that you have them to make teas throughout the, the year then, rather than uh, you'll need a big freezer if you're freezing lots of different teas, you know. But if you dry the herbs and you can make the, the herbal teas with the dried herbs later at any time of the year then. Uh, how long will dried herbs last? Um, dried herbs will, um, if you dry them properly, um, you'll usually get two or three years from them. It's really down to how well you store them. Um, you need to make sure that you store them away from heat and light and somewhere that isn't damp. If, they get, if any dampness gets into them, then they'll get ruined with mold in the space of a couple of days and you'll just need to throw them out then. Um, but um, as long as they stay dry and you don't have them in strong light or strong heat, then they'll usually keep for a couple, couple of years and they don't go off. They just get less potent as they age. So, um, you know, it's, it's fine really to use older herbs as long as they're not damp. You, you're just, this is the sort of thing that comes with experiences. You really need to be able to recognize the smell of them when they've gone damp, um, it's very unpleasant. Um, so it's not difficult to notice actually, but you'll, you tend to smell the damp before you see the mold in the plant. I, I've kind of got to the stage where I'm able to smell it a couple of months before the mold appears, but I can smell that there's damp in there. Um, so, uh, and store them, I recommend when they're dried, store them in uh, brown paper bags because that will allow the air to circulate and um, just allow any more moisture that there is in the herb to, to leave. If you put them straight in, if you put them straight into jars when you've initially dried them, then 
they do tend to continue to, to lose water for a while. So if you put, pop them straight into a jar with a the lid, then they'll tend to trap moisture and go mouldy. So um, I, I make sure I've dried them. I, it's a few months before I put them into a jar, basically. Um, I, I tend to keep them in paper, brown paper bags and, and that's uh, in a cupboard then in the dark or a storage box in the dark and that's uh, that's I find the best way uh, to store them. Um, is that okay? Any more questions about drying herbs or shall I go back to the silver reed? Okay we can come back to it if you've got more questions. Um, <clears throat> okay uh, ooh. Oh, very good. So Paul says, a friend of mine has been making nettle tea to go with the nettle and chickpea curry he has been making. That sounds lovely. And he has also been making dandelion syrup. Yeah, so I mean, that, they're great examples of how you can start to substitute wild local herbs, wild foods into ordinary dishes that you're making anyway. So if you're doing a curry, the traditional one there really would be the, the chickpea sag, sag chana, which is spinach and chickpea. So really what he's done there is he's substituting spinach um, uh, with a, a, a green wild vegetable, the, the nettle. So, I mean, that's a, a great idea. You just need to make sure the nettle's cooked really well so that it doesn't sting. Um, but that's a really good uh, way to use them. And whenever you can use wild plants that are on your doorstep, they're so much more nutritious than things that we buy from the shops because of how our food supply reaches us, because of things being grown on the other side of the world and stored in containers to stop them ripening and, and warehouses to stop them ripening until they're on the shelf of the supermarket and things. So it's a long journey from where the plant grows to it as actually eating it and the more we can shorten that journey and um, the better nourished we are and, and the less food we actually need to eat because it, it's not about the volume really it's about the nutrient content and um, the, the more things that you eat that are that are fresh and are close to you, the, the, the less actually you, you need to eat to feel full. And I've got a humongous appetite, so um, I'm not one to be um, uh, be fobbed off with a, I would always say, what's that children's portion? <laughs> you know, I like a big plate of food, but um, um, I really notice when you, when you eat um, a lot more, uh, or even just drink a lot more of the teas. You, you, you don't need this huge bulk of, you don't need the bulk, you know, this two for one supermarket stuff. If it was just more nourishing in the first place, we wouldn't need all this extra. Um, so that is a lovely example of combining a, a, a local wild food into a, a dish that you'd be familiar with making anyway. It's a really good idea. Thank you. I think I might try that actually. <laughs> Um, right, I'm going to come back to the silver weed <coughs> before it, it goes all droopy. So, so medicinally, uh, well actually nutritionally, that when silver weed is fresh, when the leaves, so I'm just going to talk about the leaves to start off with, we'll come on to the roots uh, afterwards. But um, silver weed is very rich in vitamin C when it's fresh, so you can make a, a vitamin C rich tea. If you look at um, silverweed and there's a couple of other plants that's related to um, tormental and, and sink foil, they're types of potentilla. Um, if you look in the old books about them, they were always using them for agues and agues is, a, is an old word which means fever. Um, so sort of like, it's quite often used to refer to malaria as well. So um, if you look in even the you know the books about Ireland, I'm I'm, I'm not necessarily referring to books from other countries. Um, they, they were they were using a lot of herbs actually to treat agues to treat fevers. So it was obviously something that they were having a lot of um, issues with. Um, but you know people lived in very damp houses uh, and uh, people still live in very damp houses, but even more so back then. Um, <laughs> Um, sorry, it's just a really nice message came in there. That was lovely. Somebody wants me to stay on here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> um, 
So, um, so fevers were something that people were dealing with a lot. So that we that's something that we learn from seeing, um, we learn about how society was from uh, and the things that people were coping with uh, by how they try to use different plants that way but um you know we know we know when we get a cold or or different viruses uh, uh, in some cases that um we know to take vitamin c and that it's good for us because we've had that drummed into us but the vitamins are actually a relatively new concept and um, you know they're they're really sort of it was just last century really where um, the concept of vitamins were developed. So long before it was common everyday knowledge to know that you take vitamin C if you get a cold, people were using local plants that were rich in vitamin C to help them when they were fighting something off when they had a fever or a temperature. So silverweed and the other potentillas are a really good example of that. Daisy is another one. Uh, Daisy, as uh, anybody who has been paying attention for the last few weeks will know, contains nearly as much vitamin C as lemons. Okay, so um, the other way that silverweed was used, again the tops, is that, um, if you make a tea of it, I mean you can make a tincture or vinegar or all these other extracts, but um, if you make a tea of it, it's very astringent. So something that's astringent is something that tightens the tissues. And uh, the, the easiest example to give you of something that's astringent in uh, normal life is um, a to it's a cosmetic ingredient, but it's a, it's a it's an easy example is a toner. So people have, people cleanse the skin and then they put on a toner to close the pores. So you've opened the pores if you've washed your skin and then you want to close them again afterwards. And so um, something that's astringent tightens the tissues so that they so that they and, and close up, you know. So that's what something astringent does. So as a medicine, um, um, uh, as a um, astringency is beneficial in several different ways. It can be useful as a gargle if you've got a sore throat. Um, that can be very helpful, and silverweed does make a very useful gargle. Um, I remember, I, I mean, I have, I've been teaching, I've been teaching about this herb for yonks, yeah, because I remember a lady from Kilkee, um, which is out in the, the west coast of Ireland here by the sea, it's lovely. Um, she, I, I taught her about, I was showing her the silverweed and daisy actually, and there, there must have been wild thyme as well. But I, I met her later and she said, oh, I had, um, she'd had an, an infection in her gums, you know, and um, she'd made a gargle of uh, silverweed because it was astringent and I'd said how useful it can be sometimes for, um, you know, minor uh, um, infections in, in the mouth and, and sore throats. And uh, she knew, I think maybe she had an abscess actually, she knew she had an infection anyway. So she combined it with thyme so time as an ordinary um, cooking time that we put into bolognese and different uh, dishes to flavor them. Um, time is phenomenally antiseptic. It's very, very antiseptic. So it's good to kill lots of different germs. So she made a tea of the silverweed leaves for the astringency to actually work on the tissues and the time then to actually fight the infection and used this gargle and mouthwash and it cleared it up. And, I mean, that was rustled up from a few weeds in the garden and a packet of dried thyme from the kitchen press, you know, from the from the kitchen cupboard, sorry, if you're not in Ireland. <laughs> and uh, just press auto-translate there. And, um, and uh, the, um, or, you know, you, you can use little packets of herbs that you buy from the supermarket. It's absolutely fine, you know, sage and thyme and, and oregano and rosemary have got lots of uh, they're wonderful medicinal herbs and if you can't get access to free wild ones or, or cultivate them yourself you can buy packets of things from the supermarket and do supermarket herbalism and it's it's fantastic you know but that was lovely for her to be able to figure that out and try that out and and it was um it did the job so it's it's just um great because that's another classic example of something that would have been another antibiotic and 
I mean, antibiotics are natural, actually, because they're made from mold, and, and mold is definitely natural. Um, but and, and they're they're just wonderful when they're used at the right time. They're fantastic, but it's just the, it's the overuse and the inappropriate use that's the issue with them. And there are so many examples of um, ways where um, there, there are so many other plants we could be using and treatments we could be using so that, you know, if they've not worked and we do know that um, uh, it's, it's definitely a job for an antibiotic then rather than starting with the antibiotic, that's it's uh, doing it the other way around really uh, for the safe everyday things, you know. Um, how many daisies are equal to 11? Uh, uh, 11? <laughs> How many daisies are equal to a lemon? It's um, it's weight by weight. So um, it's um, it's the it's the it's if you measure them in micrograms, then the, it's nearly the same amount of weight of daisies compared to the same amount of weight of lemon. Uh, is it's nearly equal levels of vitamin C. Yeah. Um, okay, so so that's uh, the the silverweed uh, astringency, and uh, again, if you've made so you can you can make a tea of it, and um, you can also, if you wanted to make a tincture or an infused vinegar, so you have it there and you have it preserved, then that absolutely go for that. So, for those of you that don't know, tinctures are a way of extracting and preserving the herb so that you have the extract available when you need it because herbal medicine is seasonal and um, herbs are tend to just be out really in the, the spring and the summer and well the autumn if it's fruits um, but um, it tends to be the winter when we get lurgy and need help so if you if you want to make a tincture you can tincture any medicinal herb that you you want to just get a clean, dry jam jar and pop the herb into the jar uh, and uh, pour on, uh, it's usually alcohol is the best thing to make a tincture. So it's the strongest alcohol that you can get in the shops um, when you're doing a, a, a DIY for home use one. So that is usually vodka or brandy. And you leave it to infuse for two weeks and you strain it off. And the murky brown liquid that you're left with is your herbal tincture. And you just take dosages of that. So it's a very concentrated uh, way to take the herb. And um, it, alcohol is a wonderful preservative. So it means that your extract keeps for years. You can, however, make infused vinegars as well. And they're just made the same way if you don't want to use alcohol. They're just made the same way, but with um, cider vinegar or white wine vinegar or red wine vinegar. And um, they do taste vinegary. I love vinegar, so they suit me, but um, you don't see them for sale. You know, you get, um, when you buy tinctures in the shops uh, or from herbalists, they're made in alcohol they're, because um, the, the market has yet to, it might happen, but people have yet to develop enough of a, palate and a nose for vinegar to start taking it um, uh, regularly as a medicine. I, I, I vinegar everything. I love, I love vinegar, so it suits me fine. <laughs> How much alcohol would be needed to make a tincture? Well, you just fill the jar to the top, to the brim, so um, it depends um, on the the texture of the herb, how much alcohol it will absorb, but you just need to make sure that the herb is coated in the alcohol. So there's a, a layer of alcohol above the herb. If it's poking up through the, the alcohol into the air, then the herb's going to be exposed to the air and bacteria and start to go off. So just make sure it's covered. Um, so I missed a question there. No, I got it, I think. Okay, jolly good. Um, yeah, does it help to chop the herb? Yeah, it can do. Uh, it depends if they're daisies. If they're something small, I wouldn't bother my tail. I wouldn't go to any extra labour for something small like that. Or the red and the red clovers, I just put in whole. But um, you can certainly for bigger things like nettles and 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 large leaves absolutely some people do them in a magi mix i mean the more that you'll to you know so they really finely chop the herb because 
the bigger the surface area um, that's exposed, the more you'll extract from it. So you will, if you pulverize the herbs, you'll, you'll make them bigger, so they're exposing more of what's inside them, and, and it's more easy for that to extract into the solvent, so the alcohol or the vinegar. So yeah, you absolutely can do that, and they do tend to be stronger. Um, but it just depends what you've got um, time for. And, um, but the, the big things, absolutely, I'd, I'd always chop the big things. I, I don't bother with delicate things like flowers um, or very small bits I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with. But roots are a classic example of that. It's hard work making the, um, or it's harder work making the, the tinctures from roots. That's usually in the autumn that we make those. They need to be dug up and they need to be washed and scrubbed and some of them are very easy to clean. Silver weed is one that's very easy to clean. But blooming dandelion roots and dot roots, oh geez, you'd be scrubbing them for hours because <laughs> they're really gnarled and the earth gets really stuck in them so that, you know, there's a lot of work goes into those and then you chop them, uh, you know, quite e as evenly as you can anyway. So there tends to be a lot more labour in that side of it. But yeah, plantain even, uh, yeah, I tend to tear that up. Uh, and uh, rather than put the leaves in whole, I would chop them or tear them up um, for making the tincture. Um, do you strain it? Yeah, you strain, if you're making a tincture, it, the, the medicine that you're going to drink is the brown liquid that's left, that's not the actual herbs. So you can throw the herbs out on the compost after you've, you know, you're infusing it in the alcohol for two weeks. So throw the herbs at the end of that out onto the compost or just out where you live, you know, in, anywhere back, back into the earth again. And uh, it's the liquid that's the medicine then, so that's the bit that you drink. Uh, okay, so I wanted to say a bit more about the astringency of the um, silverweed because it can be used as a, 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 I was talking more about internal uses with a sore throat. It's, it's because it's astringent, it's something that um, it might sometimes be helpful for people if they have irritable bowel. Um, so herbs that are quite astringent, and there are loads of them. There, somebody asked me about rose bay willow herb on here a couple of weeks ago, and I was saying I just haven't got around to using it because there are so many plants that grow here anyway that work in the same sort of way. Um, so rose bay willow herb is very astringent and would be something that you could consider putting into um a, a, a medicine for somebody with irritable bowel and and silverweed is another e example of that there are just loads of them um there really are so um that would be another internal use but an external medical one would be um it's it's really good if you make a compress of it and apply it to varicose veins or hemorrhoids so hemorrhoids are just varicose veins in a very uncomfortable, intimate place, okay? And then varicose veins tend to be on the legs. Um, but again, there are loads of herbal treatments that can help with varicose veins, but uh, what a lot of them have in common is their astringency, and they tend to tighten and tone uh, the, the veins and help to bring relief to the pain because it can be very painful. So silverweed, um, it's it's pretty easy to make the compress. I mean, really, you're just making a strong tea and dipping a bit of fabric into it and applying it to the to the veins, and it's doing it regularly then. But that can be really, really helpful um, for relieving uh, relieving the pain and using the the hemorrhoids or the the varicose veins. So again, really, really simple. It's th there's there's so much benefit to your potential benefit to your life. For a bit, to learn about the plants that are growing around you that are easy to identify but are prolific because um, there are just you know thousands and thousands and thousands of medicinal and edible wild plants but if you can learn daisies are prolific dandelions are prolific silverweed is prolific and and they're really pretty much foolproof to identify if you can learn those and learn them quite well then you're going to be able to rustle up a, a, a remedy or or a food pretty easily a lot of the time you know so 
be um, canny about the ones you choose to learn because um, it, some things are fleeting, they're not there for very long in the year or you might need, they're only available in certain habitats. If you can get to know the ones that are abundant where you live, then um, that's the thing that, that will make a big difference to your life because if it's widely available and it's available to harvest for quite a few months as well, then um, it's, uh, it's, that's a really useful thing for you to get to know and the, the, the more likely you are to use it because there are a lot more opportunities for doing so. Um, does silverweed have a flower? It does, it's too early. It's usually the summer where you'll see the flower. It's got a, a small yellow flower. <coughs> How's that? I think it's five petals. Um, yeah, but it's got a yellow flower. Uh, can you eat the leaves or are they too astringent? Do you know, I haven't eaten them because they are so astringent, but I do have a friend who puts them into hummus and they kind of give it this silvery color. So. Um, I would say you need a really good food processor uh, and um, just uh, use a small amount of it because things that are astringent are very drying. They dry things up. So it isn't something I'd want to sit down and chomp through a, a portion of, you know, I think it would, it would be that sort of thing where you pucker up, you know. Um, but um, I, I, th I think they're, they're much nicer in, in a tea. Um, the roots are the things that are wonderful wild foods. They are really good to eat, uh, which I'll come on to. Um, yeah, is that okay? Uh, is that okay about the leaves? Are we all right with that? So just to finish off on the astringency then, as I said, um, they, they're... Um, they, they, they were used for varicose veins that way. So they were also used cosmetically as a toner for the skin, but also it was one of the many, many plants that um, people used to use to try and reduce freckling. So, I mean, why they want to get rid of freckles, I don't know, but the herbal books are full of, oh, this one was used to try and get rid of freckles. So I don't know uh, why they were trying to do that. I like freckles, um, or, but... Um, or how effective the herbs were at getting rid of the freckles, but that was certainly something they were doing with the, the silverweed, yeah. So um, if we come on to the, um, the roots then, has anybody used silverweed? Is this new to all of you? That's what I wanted to ask. It starts to get really interesting when we come on to the root because <clears throat> the root, um, is a very nourishing, very, very nourishing wild food. And silverweed grows around the world. It grows in Ireland, the UK, it grows on mainland Europe, it grows in China, it grows in Tibet, it grows in North America, um, it grows in Hong Kong. I remember somebody saying to me, who was on a walk with me, yes, we've got that in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, lovely. Oh yeah. Oh hi Emma, how are you? Great. <laughs> Uh, and Christine, you're saying it's new to you and it's very interesting to learn. Yeah, it is. It, it, I think this plant is really interesting and just so overlooked, you know, um, which is why I wanted to dedicate this lesson to it today. So, um, it, so silverweed has the capacity to live in these very different environments. So I've told you it's, it, you'll find it growing down by the beach a lot of the time, yet you'll find it growing up high on, on hills. And um, it grows in uh, Tibet, which is a plateau. It's very high up and it grows there. And actually, all, all through these different places, it is renowned as being a, 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 nutrition, a really nutritious wild food. And it's sometimes referred to as a famine food because people, when crops fail, go back to uh, eating silverweed roots you know, when potatoes or, or whatever things that they're cultivating fail, because silverweed is abundant, it grows prolifically, you know, and this is actually what we ate before we imported the potato from Peru. This was our, our native starchy food that, that we would eat, and it was replaced then by potatoes when they were brought over from um, the Americas. 
And, um, but the Native Americans ate silverweed roots as well. Um, and uh, it's very, very well known as a wild food. And you can either steam the roots or they can also be um, dried and processed and made into flour. And, and it's uh, people baked, baked bread and different things with it. So it's, it's very, very, very nutritious. Um, there are different questions and comments coming in here, which I'll get to, don't worry. I heard it was used to line shoes to make them comfortable if they were rubbing because it's so soft. Yeah, the leaves. Yeah, I could absolutely imagine doing that with it. They're they're lovely and soft. Yeah, go out and after this class today, your homework is to go out and find a silverweed leaf and stroke your face with the silverweed leaf because it's lovely. <laughs> is it hard to dig up with a trowel or a shovel? It depends on the conditions that it's growing in. Uh, it's a really good question, um, Breed, and so it will just depend, and it grows in all sorts of different conditions. So if it's very clay soil and it's wet, then that's the hardest work to dig it out of there. Um, if it's in sandier soil, then it's easier to pull up because the soil's not sticky, sticky and wet. Um, <clears throat> but it's um, it's very easy to dig up. So when I first found out then that it was what we ate before we um, imported the potato, I thought, but why? Why on earth did this, did the potato take over? Because as this popular food, because silver wheat is absolutely abundant. It's just everywhere and, and it grows without any effort. You don't need to go out and feed them and spray them. You know, potatoes are a really heavily sprayed crop if they're not organic and there are loads of work to grow organically. They take loads of feed and they're very susceptible to pests and blight and all the rest of it. And you need huge area of land to grow spuds, you know? So I thought, why on earth did potatoes um, uh, usurp the silverweed roots? And then I dug one up and I discovered <laughs> that they have the diameter of my pinky. So um, this is a silverweed root and this is dirty. I've still, I've left the soil on, but it's very quick and easy to wash off. Um, and, um, yeah, I find with roots, to come back to a bit what, what I was saying there about the, the nettles and the dock and the dandelion roots, with roots, there's labour in it at some point, basically. So with some roots, they're very easy to dig up, uh, but they're hard work scrubbing them and washing them. So dandelion roots are like that and dock roots are like that too, really. Um, and... Um, and with other roots, they, they grow much nearer the, the surface. But again, you're scrubbing them for ages. And then other ones, this if I just rinse this under the tap, the earth would just come away. So if I, I'll just rub it with my fingers. Hang on and I'll show you. I've managed to make a little cleanish patch there just by rubbing it. I'm just trying not to get the soil on my keyboard, sorry. <laughs> there's, no, there's not this hazard when we do classes in real life, but I'm trying not to break all my technology. <laughs> Um, so um, they're a lovely pale colour, you just rinse them under the tap. So yeah, how difficult it is to dig them up just depends on the type of land that you're digging them up from So um, and how much has been raining. But um, there are definitely some areas where it's, much, it's a much quicker job to dig them up than others. Um, it, but it's very quick to just rinse them and all you need to do is chop them and steam them. They're very, very easy to cook and, and cook quickly. And they are absolutely delicious. They go really starchy. It's amazing because they're so small, but they're really starchy and they've got a lovely nutty flavor. And although they're small, they, they, are, they are filling to eat. So, um, so they're not big, like, you know, we wouldn't be doing bake, big baked silverweed roots like we would bake potatoes. So they're not as big and filling, but they, grow with ease uh, and um, it's not a big job to pick a lot of them and they are extremely nourishing and they've not been sprayed with rubbish you know there's just so much in our food um, cycle that is harmful you know I'd like to meet the person who tricked everybody into believing that um, it was hunky-dory to poison the water and the food in the land and, and that we'd all be okay but you know to save a bit of money I just don't know how people manage to be conned by that. But uh, anyway, that's what we've been living in. 
Um, so, uh, you know, you, 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 every time you're doing something like this, you're, you're reducing your exposure to all these artificial things that plants are treated with. I mean, there's a residue in everything anyway, because it all gets into the water supply, so it's still not clean, you know, it's still um, not clean because when chemicals get into the water, they go everywhere, but it's a lot less than uh, cultivated foods because it's not being directly uh, treated on purpose, you know, frequently. I remember, who was at that class? Is anybody in today from Gori? There's a few people from Wexford. There was one class once where we said something about the debate between buying organic and buying local. And do you remember the person talking about the carrots? She'd said it to her to her neighbour who was a farmer, and he said, "Was it sixteen times? Sixteen times I spray my carrots. You know, I mean, it's just a huge number of times every crop was sprayed. We were all really shocked at how much it was. You know. Anyway, um, so you just rinse them and and steam them, and they are really delicious. A lot of the times, when I try things that are um, famine foods, uh, so things that we go back to eating when crops fail." I think, oh well, I suppose if it was that or starvation, I would I would eat that rather than starve. But these are just absolutely delicious. So the best time to dig them up actually isn't just now. I just dug it up to show you. Um, the best time to dig them up is um, in the autumn because when the tops of the plants start to die back, it puts the goodness into the root and that helps to keep the, root, the plant alive over the winter. So they're more nourishing if you dig them up in the autumn but when you're starting to to learn about roots you know all roots under the ground are hard to identify so you'll need to dig them up at a time where the leaves are still there and you can trace it down and recognize that you've definitely got the root of the same plant yeah because you don't want to dig up a different root and cook it and poison yourself okay so um, go out in the autumn and just when, you know, when you can still see that the green is there, dig it up and then you'll begin to recognise the shape of the root, the way it grows, the smell of it and, and what it looks like when you've washed it and cleaned it. So um, it's really useful. But it's, um, it, it was, it's also, um, as I mentioned, I haven't done this. I do keep meaning to every year go, I must do this and I haven't done it. Uh, I do be busy. Um, but I'd love to make the flower from it. I would absolutely love to make the silverweed flower and try using it that way. And I'll tell you an interesting fact. This is actually, flower made from the root of silverweed is actually the staple crop in Tibet. If you go to Tibet, then they are very reliant on a flower called Droma, D-R-O-M-A. And that's what it is. It's made from the root of the silverweed plant. And um, I've uh, shown it to people from Tibet who've been over here in Ireland and dug it up and they said, oh yeah, Droma, Droma, yeah. And um, it's because, to come back to how it grows again, um, it flourishes on the plateau. So people think that, um, uh, uh, Westerners can think that everybody in Tibet is vegetarian. They're not because it's very hard to grow and cultivate vegetables in Tibet um, because it's so high up. Uh, very little grows there. So actually the diet is mostly based on uh, milk and pork. And um, there's, there's, there's actually very little bread, uh, uh, veg. So the, the roots of the silverweed are, that's why they're such a key part of the diet there. And um, yeah, you get the, the sacks of flour made from the silverweed root at, at the markets and things. <clears throat> fascinating isn't it the more you learn about this I mean the more you learn about plants in the world I, I was just lucky to I've done a lot of things at conferences so people so if Nancy's still here hi Nancy I'm <laughs> sorry about you but people would still and um, people from all sorts of different parts of the world would come to the conferences and through taking hair box that those and I'm just showing them stuff that grows in Ireland and the UK and are commonplace herbs and they think oh geez these poor people from Australia they're going to be really bored but no they'll say to me oh no we've got that and certainly in Australia a lot of the plants um you know obviously they've got their own unique habitat there but 
um, a lot of Western plants, uh, European plants ended up there because when the Europeans settled down there, they brought their weeds with them for better or for worse. So um, they're there and um, yeah, this just seems to grow anywhere that isn't tropical basically. So the plants that I cover in my, my courses grow in basically any country, generally most of them, grow in any country that isn't tropical. It's just fascinating that um, we've got so many similarities, you know, we're all more the same than we are different, I think, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I, plants always remind me of that. Um, how would you store the roots through the winter? Can you store them? Well, I think the thing is then, it would be drying them and processing them into the flower, you know, which I haven't done. Um, and I've been meaning to that. I've been meaning to do that for at least ten years, Liz. I'm sorry, <laughs> and I still haven't done it. Um, but um, if I can't get back out teaching classes in real life this year, this could be the year. This could be the year where all these things um, uh, have have harvested. Um, I, I, you are talking to somebody who's harvested seeds from red clover and made bean sprouts from them and I've done that several years you know so this could be my silver weed flower year yeah um but um that would be the purpose of the flower would be that you you have then um this nutritious extract that you can use whenever you need to as a really vital food source um whereas the 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 roots you'd you'd use them in the autumn but it, you'd need to make sure that you can still safely identify them you know so i don't know how well they would store if you just dug them up and stored them in a paper bag like you do potatoes with, with the air still still on them i haven't tried it i don't know Um, i think i would be again because uh, i live here i'd be concerned about the damp again you know Um, but it's the same with the spuds you're not going to store spuds uh wet either they're going to go off too um I think Mike, who cooked using nettles and dandelions, has joined. Ah, ah, okay, okay, Mike. If you're on, then you just need to um, thank you for doing that. Just put, click the chat bar, um, so you can click. Just juggle your mouse until you get the icons at the bottom, and click the chat button, and then you can type your questions in at the side. We heard about your. Uh, spinach chana uh your 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 foraged sag chana spinach um natalie chickpea curry i was very impressed <laughs> so you're very welcome mike <laughs> okay um thanks for prompting me for that because i didn't notice i can't see all the names of the people there's so many people on there i can't see them all without stopping and scrolling through it Nancy, um would you use the tops in spring and the roots in fall yeah you generally do so um, so the roots in the spring, it's just really, if you dig up roots in the spring, the, the, the plant is moving its energy up into the top, into where it's growing. So just now it's going into growing the leaves and producing the flowers. So um, thanks. Paul says on the phone, you need to press the screen to get the chat options. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I always use this on the computer, so I haven't used it from a phone. Um, so the, the goodness of the plant is going up into the leaves and, and making the flowers, that's where it's focusing its energy on. So um, when these bits die back, it goes back into the roots and they're at their most nutritious. It doesn't mean that there's nothing in the roots just now, um, you know, at this time of year. It's just that they're better to harvest later in the year. I've never um, dug them up at this time of year before. Um, I just did it so that I could show them to you and I thought I wonder if there'll be much of a, a root because as you can see they're small anyway so I was surprised when I got this one but then this is a plant that comes back year after year so it's quite an old one just remember a well-established one just remember when you dig up the roots and um, you know unless you're breaking bits off and, and there are various different shoots with the silver weed then you are uprooting the plant and, and that's the end of that plant. So if you leave bits of root on the ground, that's great. It, it will um, come back again. Um, but it does tend to be the tops of the silverweed. Um, it's not just in the spring. You'll, you'll get fresh green silverweed for months, actually, you know, because it's just one that keeps growing and produce, producing fresh leaves. Don't use, I know this is wilting because I've pulled it out of the ground, but 
use them when they look fresh and vibrant, um, they will start to look a bit yellow and dry as they've got old. So just keep looking for the fresh, green, vibrant uh, leaves uh, uh, if you're using the tops. And then, you know, the fall, you know, late August, September is, is a great time then to um, try digging the roots, but they're just delicious. I think they're absolutely delicious, really, and filling. It's amazing how filling they are. They're really starchy and nutty tasting. I think they're great. Um, there we are. A any more questions? You okay? It's amazing how long we can talk about one plant for, isn't it? I'm just going to have a slurp of tea. <clears throat> and um, I sometimes make it with... Um, a little, a little autumn wild food plate. So I have the cooked silver weed roots. You don't need a, a mountain of them, you know, just a, a little portion. Uh, the one of the pestos, the sorrel and hazelnut pesto, is one I can make in the autumn. <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, and um, uh, the haw chutney, the, the chutney is made chutney made from the haw fruits. So that's the hawthorn we were talking the, the pre class last Tuesday was about the blackthorn and the hawthorn um, and uh, yeah so it's it's a lovely little autumn plate of, of wild food it's a really nice thing to do and you get such different flavors with wild foods as well you'll notice that a lot of the plant the the foods that we buy from the shops are you know there's only so many flavors we get it it gets quite bland but when you start to use a few wild um a few wild plants you really expand your palate there's such a variety of flavors in wild plants that just are not in shop bought ingredients and they have all sorts of knock-on consequences and benefits for our health um, Besides flower, what else can you do with the roots? Well, you just steam them. I don't know if maybe you joined late. Um, you just wash them and chop them and steam them as you would do potatoes. They only take five minutes to cook. They're absolutely great. They're really nice. And that's the way that they go really starchy. Um, some people do um, uh, use them raw in salad, but I don't recommend them that way. You you need to cook them to bring out the starchiness, and that's the thing that makes it really tasty, but also very filling. You know, it's much more digestible and makes you feel much more full up. You're getting a lot more benefit from it that way if you use it that way. Um, is that okay? Any more questions about silverweed, or shall I move on to general questions about extracts and things and herbs? I can come back to it if you're typing. If you're typing things in, it's okay. I know it takes a wee while to type things in, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Oh, this is a great question. Okay, so Martin's saying, just assume it had been sprayed with weed killers last year. Have you any knowledge from research about how long residue will remain in the plant just out of a matter of interest? Do you know, we're beginning to get more information about this now. Um, and this is a great question and it comes up a lot actually in, in my classes and online courses and things. What happens when you start to look at using wild plants as and, and picking them yourself and using them as either medicines or wild foods is that the barrier between how your how the plant is processed and you actually and arriving to you is broken down. And you're starting to become aware of where is it growing? What are the conditions it's growing in? Is it next to the traffic? Is this stuff covered in car fumes? Um, what's, what, has it been sprayed? You know, if you're not buying organic stuff, has it been sprayed? What's the residues in it? And this is a great thing to start to think about because what's happening is you're really connecting into your food source in a way that you haven't done before. And when we buy things from a shop, they're, you know, in loads of cases, they're grown next to the road. They're grow I've seen soft fruit farms uh, next to motorways, you know? So just because something is in a brightly packaged, nicely labeled and marketed box uh, or plastic tub, 
doesn't mean that it's been grown miles away from traffic and hasn't been sprayed with stuff. It's usually the opposite. So it's not labelled. Uh, you know, our, our food labelling is the wrong way around. You know, really, um, it should be labelled when it's treated with chemicals, not not when you know all these people who are farming organically have to pay a fortune to go and well have to you know they have to pay a lot of money to get their organic certification. Whereas if we had a sense to show that they're not doing anything harmful to, to what their, their food supply that they're selling you. Whereas, you know, if it was a logical world, it would be the other way around. It would be labeled with, has been sprayed with stuff, repeatedly has been sprayed 16 times, you know, has been grown next to the traffic, but we're working in a world that's uh, the wrong way around at the moment. So the more we think about this, the better. And, um, yeah, if you're, um, uh, I'm, I'm preparing a lesson actually for my students just now on how to recognise things when they've been treated with weed killer. So it's much more obvious on the foliage of the plants. So on the, the leaves and the flowers, you can see it's usually, well, it's bright bluey green when it's just had weed killer applied to it. Um, but it's, it very quickly turns to sort of a pale yellow. It looks like it's been burnt. Um, and, and that's it um, dying off just temporarily, you know, because the plant is still alive. And, and this is what makes your question really good because um, the root is still alive and, and the root's still going. Weed killer is designed to be absorbed into the plant to kill it in, in, inside so that it all dies off. But as anybody who's ever treated dandelions knows, they keep coming back, you know. So some plants are really, really resilient and keep coming back. Where you stand on the scale of what you're happy to pick is that's your personal decision. And the ideal world, um, yeah, we should be labeling vegetables as we label cigarettes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, it, the, in, the, um, in an ideal world, you know, we'd all be living on organic land and we'd just be eating foods that's nowhere near poison uh, and um and it would be it would be healthy stuff but you know few but i don't live that way i don't live in the middle of an organic farm and um, so i have to make decisions about <clears throat> risk versus um versus benefit and um i also accept that there's a huge amount of damage in the environment and that you know that is going to take a long time to change and i'm not immune to the ill effects of that either um, it's going to take a long time to get chemical residues out of water. When they get into water, it's a big problem because it goes everywhere, you know? It goes from non-organic land to organic land. You can't stop water moving around. So it goes from into rain and down on the earth and, you know, so it's, it's a big issue. Uh, and I hope that this is something, it's certainly part of why I do what I do. I hope this is something that improves during my lifetime, however long or short that may be. And, um, and uh, if it doesn't happen while I'm still alive, I hope that my, wor my work is part of, you know, the next generation embracing it and improving it again and taking it to the next level of being better and understanding this better. As I said, I just think it was quite the con where somebody was um, at some stage said, no, let's just poison the food and the land and the soil and it'll be, it'll be fine, you know. Um, so hopefully we're, we're part of a process of unravelling this. But um, I think, you know, ideally get to know where you live and you'll notice if you, if you just spend this year just noticing things, you'll see where areas have been treated with weed killer. And so you'll know to avoid picking the the roots from there that year you'll find places that haven't been treated with weed killer because there are bits of land that nobody cares about maintaining so you'll find you know old train lines can be good old tram lines uh, old cemeteries can be good um trees are great because people apart from where i live where the trees are flipping sprayed but that's another story uh but um trees generally are not usually and they're not usually sprayed with weed killer and so you can pick flowers and fruits from there if you're in the city then you know parks are maintained if you're in the country parks are maintained with weed killer but if you look up 
then you'll get things that are out of that range of making the grass look neat. So it's a personal thing. Bear in mind that it's standard practice for a lot of crops that we eat all the time, like wheat, for them just to be treated with weed killer to make the foliage die off to make it easier to harvest. So again, you're not seeing that. It's not on the label, but it's happening. Um, so it, it's a personal decision really about what you're happy to pick yourself. But don't think that it's not happening to stuff that you're you're buying that's packaged in pretty labels because it is a, 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 you know most of the time unless you're buying organically. Um, but it's it's very useful to observe where you live and and you'll start to notice damage like that. But you'll also if you keep watching it over over the seasons you'll see it come back and thrive as well. So. Uh, I, what I say to people is don't pick it when there's obvious signs of damage. I would never pick a, um, I would never pick a plant where it looks unhealthy. Um, so the same way that you go into the supermarket, you wouldn't pick a cabbage or, or spinach that had gone brown and was all wilted because you can see it's not at its best. So I would apply those same instincts to picking wild plants. Um, and um, so as long as they look vibrant and healthy, then I, I would go for picking them. But it's a very personal thing. Yeah. And I think it's it's really useful for people to start to develop this awareness because the more people are aware of it, the more people will want to change things and improve things for everyone then. Is that OK? Is that helpful on that question? It comes up a lot. There has been some research done um about i've seen a couple of things over the last sort of two years coming in about r residues of weed killer and and things i must um go back and pull those up again but um the general thing is that the plants come back pretty quickly they recover pretty quickly which just goes to show you how <laughs> useless it is applying weed killer a lot of the time it's so harmful and in ineffective a lot of the time for what people what it is that people are trying to do with it yeah um is that all right are you all okay um so if you um any more quick did you find the silverweed interesting i i think it's um it's such a humble unassuming little plant and it's just for so many people around the world to have been dependent on it really as a food and and for it to have adapted and lived in so many different environments i just think it's uh fantastic Oh, great. Can't wait to try the roots in the autumn. Great, great. Well, you can go and make the tea just now as well, you know. You can just mix it in. When you're making herbal teas, you can blend different ones. So there's loads in season just now. Um, I'm drinking at the moment, you know, just I make a weed tea, a weed, spring weed tea every morning. So um, I've got the nettles, cleavers, daisy, plantain, uh, put a dandelion flower in this morning, some red clover. Um, so you could put the silverweed tops in there too. There just wasn't very much of it actually this morning. I just kind of got the first clump of it and wanted to bring it in um, to show you. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll be starting drinking silverweed leaves over the next couple of weeks as when, when, when more of them start to appear. I did want to point out, it does look a little bit similar to the other plants you might see just now with silvery leaves are, um, it's actually meadow sweet. So meadow sweet has got silvery leaves as well, but it, it doesn't grow this way. And it's got a dark brown stem, but um, they're actually related. And meadow sweet is a lovely, lovely medicinal and edible plant too. But just in case you see something else that's got silvery coloured leaves and you think, oh, well, that isn't the silverweed. That might be what you come across just now. Um, I knew nothing about this hair before. Yeah, I know. It's great, isn't it? I, I love silverweed. It's really, really interesting. Uh, oh, no, is it cold? <laughs> Jenny's saying, really fascinated, fascinating, perfect for a cold, wild, wet morning. That means the cold, wild, wet is coming up here. We've not quite got it yet, damn. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you are interested, um, if you've done this before, by all means leave, but if you are interested in learning more, going on to learn more detail, silverweed is one of the plants that I teach.
teach about in my video course and um, I've got a lesson about it in spring to, uh, showing you how to make the, the tea, the infusion and the compress for the varicose veins and hemorrhoids and I've got a video lesson in the autumn one showing you how to cook the roots. Um, so what I can do is I can just pull up the video course to show you how to use it so that if you are interested in going on to learn in more detail, then uh, you can see what the course is like. Uh, I've been, I made this video course in 2015, so this is actually my sixth year um, of uh, students joining it. And funnily enough, at the moment, it's much more popular than usual because so many people are, are um, at home with time on their hands and an internet connection. So, um, can you see my website? I, I've gone on to screen share mode. Can somebody type in the chat bar and let me know that you've seen it? Because every time I do this, the chat bar disappears. Thank you. We've got a question coming in. Do you give an online presentation on a Tuesday? I have been, yeah, I did them on, um, I do them every year. I do an introductory one every year since 2015. So that, oh, you've got my screen, thanks. I've got, I've got all your things now. <clears throat> thanks for that. Um, I do a free one usually about what's available at different stages of the year and um, just an introductory one and then if people are interested in going on to learn more obviously they can if they want to but it's again it's just to open people's eyes these are only very general things it's just to open people's eyes to what's around them um, because I just think it's a, a lovely lovely thing to learn um, so yeah I did several of them in March and then in April I did them on Friday mornings and this month I've moved them to Tuesdays um, and uh, I should do some for the evening as well because um, I, it's, it's kind of ruling out people in America and things at the moment where I'm doing them in the morning time. Anyway, but you'll get, Paul, you'll get, everybody gets the recording so and I've put the recordings from the last um, half dozen of them all onto one web page. The first few ones I thought were a bit too similar so I, I because I was just doing a general introduction to spring herbs and then it kind of got more. <laughs> we started, <coughs> excuse me, just looking at, at a couple of them at a time. So I've, I've put them all onto one page so you'll get the recordings later on when I send around the video from today, don't worry. Um, yeah, usually 11, yeah. Um, I'll send it around uh, later. Anyway, right, so the video course is here, so if you just go to the members area, all you need, I get so many messages, I've got so many emails to answer today from people saying, I can't get Zoom to work. You don't need Zoom to do my um, online course, it's just all you need is an email address and a password and you just sign in and out because the whole thing is pre-recorded. I just do live webinars like this via Zoom you know, usually once a month, but I'm doing them twice a month at the moment because there are so many new students. And um, I just do them so that people have got a chance to ask their questions. Um, because I know the difference between being able to do something with confidence and not having the confidence to do it and consequently not, get, not getting into your hobby that you've always wanted to learn is being able to ask questions. So you just sign in with your email address and password there's a little welcome video there and little welcome information there about how to use the course. But I support it with live webinars like this. If people can't attend them live, then you can send me in your questions in advance and I'll cover them during the webinar and then you can watch the recording afterwards. And you do not need Zoom to watch the recording either. I host them on my website, so it's fine. You don't need any software to access it. Um, there's also a private Facebook group as well, which has got a lot of life in it at the moment because there are so many new people on and they've got a lot more time to spend interacting on it. And it's lovely, they're sharing all sorts of recipes and things on there, so it's really nice. Um, there are the dates for the upcoming webinars for students and then you can go into the course. So they're divided into spring, summer and autumn to help you to dip in and out and see what's growing around you. Uh, at that time of year. So if we go into the spring one, um, at the very top are safety guidelines, uh, foraging, so just to keep you safe when you're foraging so you don't uh, 
make a mistake and pick something poisonous. Um, same thing with medical stuff and, and uh, a heads up about different poisonous plants. Um, so you just need to watch those the very first time that you log in. Um, they're really basic. Um, it's the foraging equivalent of teaching you how to use a light switch without electrocuting yourself. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> You know, um, as long as you stick to um, basic safety things, it's fine. Um, we don't all, we all use electricity every day, but we don't all become electricians, you know. Some of us, all of us know how to use sockets and, and light switches. Some of us might get more into it and learn how to rewire a plug. And then uh, anything more complex than that is for electricians. And we're doing the herbal medicine and foraging equivalent of that. So this is the solid foundation that is teaching you how to use a plug and electricity and light switches with, without any difficulty yeah because everybody can do this if they want to you know it's it everybody knows daisies and dandelions and nettles and planting is easy and there are just so many of them silverweed is one nobody said today i've never seen that plant before you said I don't know anything about it. I haven't used it, but you didn't say I've never seen that before and I don't recognize it. So it's easy to recognize, you know. So um, the plant lessons are here then and you just click them to go into them. So I will pull up Silver Reed today, seeing as that's the one that we did. And um, here we are. So it's got the Latin name. If you're still on, the lady who asked about the flower, there's the little yellow flowers. I was right, it's five petals. I had a moment of doubt there when I was describing it earlier, but yep. So five uh, yellow petals in the silver weed. And that's it growing on the concrete, actually. I think I took that one in my driveway. So you can see it growing over the concrete. And then um, every plant lesson has got the name of the plant in uh, Latin because that helps us to identify it. Common names can overlap and be confusing. Um, so all the contents and um, we start at the top with the identification stuff. So I've got videos. For me, the point of an online course is um, videos and, and photographs, hundreds and hundreds of photographs and videos. Um, it's to make use, use of the visual format. I would much rather sit and read information about a plant in a book. Um, I don't want to sit and look at a screen to read loads of text, but the, the point of online stuff is that you can produce all these videos and photographs and um, they're, they're a much better way of helping you become confident at identifying the plants because you see the habitat that they grow in. I frequently look at photos in books and uh, so you can see there that's quite wet ground where it's growing. I frequently look at photos in books and um, just think, oh jeepers, they just don't look anything like that plant. But a video is a really, really good way to look at it and you get the scale then as well. I'm only five foot two. That will help you with the scale. <laughs> um, and then there are photos as well, close-ups to help you with identification too. There's the back of the leaf that's really, really silvery. There really isn't anything else that looks like it. That's it growing through concrete. You'll see it coming up in these rosettes. Um, yeah, it's lovely. And that's it when it's flowering. And then, sorry, I'm just hopelessly in love with them. I love them. <laughs> Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, and then I've got these plant data sheets. They're, you know, really basic information for you and jargon-free language about the plants. I'm not using complicated botanical terms or herbal medicine terms. Um, I've got the names in Latin, English, and where possible, Irish, German, French, Italian, and sometimes Spanish as well. Um, so just what kind of plant is it? Is it a little weed in the grass? Is it a tree? Where and when should you be looking for it? Really basic information to make it as um, easy as possible for you to find and recognise. <clears throat> then I've got a little bit of information about using it as a, a food. I don't recommend you shove it in the juicer because it's so astringent. I think that will make you pucker up. Um, and I've got some basic recipes there for um, making the tea and cooking it. And then we come on to using it as a remedy. So that's more as a herbal medicine. 
and I've mentioned as colds and gargles for sore throats and uh, irritable bowel, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, we talked about that today. And then I've got more serious things that uh, herbalists running a clinic, so that's people like me might be doing with it rather than just DIY home remedies. So we might look at it for uh, more serious uh, conditions in the of kidney, kidney and bladder disorders. <clears throat> And I've always got then dosages of the tinctures and the tea for adults and children. So that's there too. So you know how much uh, to take. And um, down here are the extract videos. So here is the video showing you how to make the, um, the infusion, which is the tea. So you can either just drink that then uh, as your tea, or you can use it um, to make a compress. So all the videos are short, they're all under 10 minutes, so that they're easy to go back and look at and look up, and they're set up like a cookery demo. And then here's part two, which is making the compress. So um, this is a compress for hemorrhoids. Uh, you'll be relieved to know I don't get any hemorrhoids out <laughs> to show you. <laughs> to show you how to make the compress, I'm not applying it anywhere into it. <laughs> There we go. Um, so all the plant lessons are um, a similar setup. So we did, did we do sorrel last week or that was a couple of weeks ago? Oh no, we did blackthorn and whitethorn last week, the hawthorn. So the hawthorn's there. Uh, sorrel, cleavers, red clover, daisy, primrose, loads of them. Then I've got a little reference to um, herbal extracts. So they're on the plant lessons, but this is to make it easier to find. So here's ointment making, because you can make ointments with lots of different herbs. It doesn't just need to be plantain or we've got plantain in this one. I did it with daisy, I did it with self heal and calendula. There's loads of them. So that's the plantain drying. And then there's the ointment. Uh, use the oil to make the ointment. Um, and all the recipes are, um, all the recipes and documents are there to print off, you can read them on the screen in colour or you can click to get a black and white version and print that off as well. And then we've got the webinar recordings. So I did some with special guests and they're really lovely. I just can't thank these people enough for sharing their little, their speciality. You know, everybody's got bits that they're really specialised in and their day about and we've had some cracking ones. Uh, so there's, there's um different ones there. I'm going to go in and reorganize it because there's so many webinar recordings now. I've got loads of them so I will restructure this bit. I'm spending the next fortnight um, just adding a few more things in and restructuring it. And then these are the Q&A recordings with me from webinars. So this year we started on the 1st of April and I just put a little note of the points that we've covered and any links to things that we've talked about. So they're there with the recording. So this is a Zoom webinar, but the recording's hosted on my website, so you don't need Zoom to play those, okay? Um, there we go. So there's three of them so far this year, that's right. And then down at the bottom, recommended resources, so recommended books. So using local plants is a, an enormous topic. You might be really interested in herbal medicine. You might be really interested in wild food. You might uh, be living in a city. There's, there's guides to, to that. You might want to cultivate medicinal herbs. Um, so there's a list of books there that I love and recommend for different reasons. Recommended suppliers. You'll need bottles and jars and bits and pieces if you're making things. And uh, my little guide to using herbs in the city as well, a few other bits and pieces. <clears throat> that's it, really. Um, that's how you use the course. It's that easy. Um, and I'll come back. So what I'm doing is everybody's got access to the course who's bought it. Yeah, you get all the up updates. Um, I'm going to... I'm adding stuff in over the next fortnight. And for those of you who are already enrolled in it, um, I'm going to send an email when I've added all the new bits in so that it's easier to find things. But I'm also just going to redo the structure a bit to make it easier to find things too, because this is year six of me adding material into it. So there's, there's just more and more stuff all the time. So I'm just cross-referencing it to make it look, um, to make it easier to find things. 
So the course um, I've made half price just now because so many people are, um, I know, um, out of work at the moment or have, um, big, have had their incomes reduced or have big worries about their income. So I've made it half price just now to um, help people. And you can either buy the course outright or you can pay monthly membership to access it. So um, the, the monthly membership is usually 20 euros a month, but I've put it down to 10. And that means you've got access to the contents for as long as you keep paying your monthly membership. The full price of the course is usually 245 euros. And that means you just keep access to it forever. I won't run webinars for the rest of my life, but I mean the contents. So being able to watch the videos and look at the photos and, and read the documents. Obviously the documents you can download and print them off anyway. Um, so the online courses are under the learn menu. Uh, bring that up click online courses and um, here we are. So you're on this today, a free introductory and formal class. And then the next one is, this is my video course, Learn With The Seasons. So just click through there and um, that will bring you to the information page about the course and all the content. So there's loads in it. The summer course has got honeysuckle and roses and that's meadow sweets that I was talking about earlier, wild raspberries, uh, self heal, there's just heaps and heaps in it, calendula, St John's wort, um, there's the silverweed compress, uh, the autumn's get hazelnut and sorrel pesto and loads of things with the berries, the rose hips and the haws and there's just heaps in there you know. Um, so there's the options for enrolling. So you can just click one or the other. Um, if you click this one, that's buying it outright. You just fill in your names, your, your name and your details there. Uh, you don't need a coupon code because I've reduced the price on the website. And you just check out then. You don't need a PayPal account to buy the course. You can just select the option to pay by a debit card or credit card. It's just there. PayPal is a secure method of paying a, paying via a debit card or credit card. That's that's why it's there. If you do the monthly membership op, member membership option, then it will uh, prompt you to save your details with PayPal so that it can charge um, every month. But you don't need to do it for the other thing. I do recommend that you get a PayPal account because um, there, it, it's really good to reduce online fraud. You know, it's um, that's the purpose of it, really. Um, so, right, okay, I can see there's a few more questions, so I'll just go through those now. And um, okay, so Martin, you disappeared. Don't worry, you'll get the. Um, for anybody whose connection was bad, everybody's going to get the video recording to this. It's usually ready at about half past four. So just check your email and wherever you've lost the live connection, you can just hop back in and watch the end of the video then. But yeah, typically we cut out when I was answering your question. <laughs> um, oh, Kira, sipping tea from what I gathered this morning. Delicious, I love the fresh nettles. That is brilliant, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, <laughs> I suppose it's between Bob Hope and No Hope. <laughs> okay, I've missed what that was referring to because that was from you know a while ago. Um, I'm really glad. Thank you for your lovely comments. There's some really nice things people are putting in here. On a different herb, does burdock grow wild in Ireland? It does, and um, it's one of the ones I've been meaning to add into the course. Actually, if I get the opportunity to do it this autumn, then I will. Because again, it's the root of burdock that we use um, rather than the, the leaves. And um, it's a very useful plant. So we've definitely got it here out west. Um, it's the one that's got really big uh, burrs that, that are sticky and they've got hooks on them. That's how they stick to your clothes. And that was how Velcro was invented, was from looking at the hooks of the burdock. Yeah. Um, Okay. Is there anything on your course to ID hemlock versus cow parsley? No, because I don't, I stick with the video course to herbs that are safe and easy to identify. And I don't agree that it's safe and easy to identify hemlock and cow parsley. 
on this format. I think it's fine to do it in person because you have to look at it in such fine detail. It's to do with the shape of the stem and how deep the curve is. And that's, I think I spoke about this last week. I know I've spoken about it on one of the, was it last week we did cow parsley? It was on one of these, sorry. Um, but I'm not happy that this course is for, to give people a solid foundation in using plants that are easy to recognize that they're not going to have an incident with basically. And cow parsley, hemlock, uh, um, hemlock water dropwort are in the carrot family of plants and they're the most dangerous family of plants that you'll encounter because there are other families of plants that have very poisonous plants in them. But they're not usually um, they're 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 not usually um, in a family of things that are that are edible. Like obviously carrots don't poison us; they're safe and edible. Um, our 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 uh, medicinal like fennel, and then our totally and utterly lethal deadly. And the thing with hemlock and hemlock water dropwort is there isn't an antidote for them. You know, so if you take them and you take enough that they kill you, there's there's nothing really that can be done. And um, if you take a small amount of them in error, I mean, I I'm I get contacted online a lot by people who have eaten them by accident, and it's not funny, you know. And even if you eat them by accident and survive, it's kidney damage that you're looking at. So it's really serious stuff, and that's you on the path to. Um, dialysis and a, a waiting list for a kidney transplant. So th that is, a, you know, I'm talking about a core level of foraging to give you the a, a knowing local plants. To, get, to go back to the electricity analogy again, what I'm trying to give you with this is, uh, you know, using the light switch and the socket safely, you know, I'm not even teaching you how to rewire a plug and I'm definitely not teaching you, training you to be an electrician that is the stuff I would consider to be carrot family stuff in advanced level training and in person with someone and you know none of us can offer that at the moment and um, I'm particularly wary of cow parsley and hemlock because the area where I live in they grow very differently um, I'm on the edge of the burren and the plants here look very different because they're grown in a different habitat to how they look in other parts of the world. So that's one of the reasons I don't go near teaching them is because um, they're very different here where I live um, and people have made mistakes because they know what the poisonous plants look like ger growing in Germany, but then when they come here, they look very different because the habitat is so different. So that's why I don't teach them. Um, there's a nice smell from cow parsley, but the other stuff smells terrible. Yeah, but the hemlock water dropwort, which is the one that grows by the water and looks like celery and parsley, it smells lovely. I mean, it really is a very tricky family of plants. It's not the place to start, you know, and I don't recommend it something that you learn online. I think that is go to specialist carrot family classes and people do run them in normal circumstances, you know. So it's not a beginner's thing. Daisies and dandelions are, are totally hunky-dory, you know. Uh, I hope that's okay. We did do that on one of these classes recently, or maybe that was for my students. It might have been actually my students. Yeah, now that I come to think of it, I think it was. Um, okay, sorry, I'll just go back through. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, yeah, it's just don't, you know, there are, where you will go wrong is with wild white flowers you know and the we frequently now when I say we I mean professional teachers and um, we frequently see people making elderflower cordial uh, and they're not making them from elderflowers they're just going out and picking wild white flowers in the ditch and making elderflower cordial from them because it's wonderful that there's this resurgence of interest in using local plants but what's terrifying actually is the combination of that and people relying on technology and apps and, and internet googling things and, and because of the way in search engines store information even if you've got the latin name you've got the right name for the plant it pulls up images of the wrong plant it's to do it's not a library you know search engines are not a library they're not logically um it, it put into order with a good reference system it's commercial 
Uh, and um, the way that they store images, for some reason, you'll get the image of the wrong plant, even though you've got the correct Latin name. So you actually need to know a lot before you can harvest useful, reliable information from the internet about plants, I, I find. And uh, I know I've seen it several times, and so have a lot of my colleagues, where people are making, and it just happens every class walk and talk that I give, there's always somebody there who says, oh, I made my elderflower cordial, and they've not made it from elderflower. The elder, lesson number one, most basic step, is a tree, you know, and they're just, Googling a picture of elderflowers, seeing a close-up of white flowers, not getting the most basic bit of identification information, which is that it's a flipping tree. <laughs> and going out and picking any wild white flower that they see because they don't realise that there's stuff that's really poisonous either. And I've known people to make elderflower cordial from hogweed flowers, from um, valerian, that's another common one that they make it from. And uh, the worst example I've ever seen was somebody making it from hemlock flowers, which is absolutely lethal, you know, and I've seen that happen more than once. So, um, you know, it's uh, when you've got basic core safety, you know, you don't turn on the light switch and think, oh my God, am I going to electrocute myself today, you know? And if you've got basic safety, techniques uh, 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 and rules that you stick to, then you're not going to do that with wild plants either. But it is really hazardous if you're going out um, and just searching and apping. The, the plant ID and foraging apps are notorious for misidentifying plants. I don't I recommend you stay well away from them. So I hope that's okay. Um, that was quite a serious note to end on, but just with you asking about cow parsley and hemlock, it's um, there are great drawings and John Renston's Edible City book has got brilliant identification drawings in, in the back, in the glossary, comparing the different carrot family plants. It's really, it's one of the best guides I've seen to it. I think it's fantastic. It's really well done. But again, um, it's not just about recognising the plant, it's about recognising how it looks in the habitat where you are. And that's the issue for it for me where I live, is that it looks very different in the habitat where I live compared to where most other people live, which is why I, you know, it's a major reason I don't use it. <clears throat> I totally love your approach to keeping people safe. Thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. I have got, I've taught thousands of people, literally, and have got a 100% record of nobody dying. <laughs> um, I used to think it was different uh, courses but I was incorrect oh is that my course well it's three yeah I did used to do them as three seasonal courses but I changed it then to they are three seasonal courses but I changed it then to monthly membership and um, so yeah it was actually originally but I changed it to membership thing so you're right <laughs> um, Thank you. Very interesting. I'll be signing up. Oh, thanks ever so much. Well, listen, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks ever so much for tuning in. I'll do another one. All being well, God willing, we're all here. I'll uh, I'll do another one next week and uh, we'll see what's opened up next week. But when you get the video recording, you'll get the page with, you know, the last half dozen of them as well. So you can go back and look at those too. But this is lovely for me because... <clears throat> It'd be lovely for me to teach this way every year, but people don't usually have the time. And one of the things that's lovely is I'm hearing actually from people, not just who have wanted to do the course for years, but haven't had the time, but people who actually bought it. And they're, they're, they've got in touch saying, how do I log in? I've never had time to use it before. And now I've got time and it's lovely, you know, and whatever happens um, just now, it, you know, and however busy life gets again, you will not lose this. You will take this with you into the next stage of life. You won't forget this. You won't forget these skills. You won't stop unseeing the plants. So, you know, this is something that you can carry forward with you in life as things begin to open up. And, you know, they will get busier again, I'd imagine. Um, uh, then, uh, you know, that's something you can carry through and bring with you. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be able to do these. And I'll, I'm going to pop them into the course as well because it's, turned into focusing in them this way. It's a lovely little resource of information for people to look back on as well.
thank you. You're so lovely. Thanks for all your lovely comments. That's really nice. So thanks ever so much for joining me. And uh, I hopefully will see you again soon. Amazing info. Thank you so much. Such an enriching way to get foraging. Yeah. Yeah, I have to bring them inside. I don't have good enough Wi-Fi to be out doing this outside for you. But then it's nice to be able to show the extracts too and to have a sharp video. I'm using a, a cable rather than a, a wee Wi-Fi thing. So um, <laughs> you're a ray of sunshine. Well, today I am. I'm not always, but thanks. <laughs> At the moment I am. <laughs> okay, bye everyone. Thanks ever so much for joining. <laughs> Cheerio.